Hello, everyone. I'm Shruti Kumtekar, Marketing Manager at Close. Thank you for joining us in our Close monthly webinar. Today, we will be discussing ServiceNow governance, risk, and compliance. Agenda. Uh, I'm going to take a couple of minutes to go through housekeeping, talk about Close, followed by the demo, and finally, Q&A. Uh, this webinar will be recorded and you will be able to access it later. For Q&A, you are on mute. If you have any questions, please use the Q&A section in your Zoom control panel and our panelists uh, will answer them. If you have any questions that are not directly relate to the, related to the webinar, uh, please email me at shruti at closing.com or sales at closing.com. Our social media channels are listed here and you can access our previous webinars at our CLOVES YouTube channel. About CLOVES, we are a ServiceNow partner since 2011, based out of Santa Clara. We are a full ServiceNow shop with 250 plus customers, uh, 400 plus implementations, and we're close to 50 consultants, and we've been executing projects globally. In terms of services, uh, we provide end-to-end -end services our focus has been on customer service management, service portals, and HRSD. Our panelist today is Dante, Senior ServiceNow Technical Architect at Cloves. Dante, uh, over to you. Looking forward to this webinar. You know if everyone can see? Yes. Awesome. All right. Just a brief background of governance, risk, and compliance, or GRC. GRC is essentially an application within ServiceNow that you are able to govern, if you will, right? Your uh, overall authority uh, documents, meaning your PCI, your COVID, your SOCs. Uh, in addition to that, also have controls uh, around the different citations uh, and run those controls testing throughout the um, life cycle or throughout the year, right? Um, so essentially, uh, we won't be covering in this uh, session, but essentially when you get ready for audit, those controls also float up to the audit application. That will be a later uh, workshop, we will actually, a uh, webinar that is, where we will go through audit management as well. Be on the lookout for that one. So again, right now, what I'm gonna cover is first, I'm gonna go through the compliance overview, which you have on your screen. Uh, talked about the reporting, how they report, and things of that nature. Second, I'm going to go through authority documents and all the relationships we have from authority documents to citations, policy statements, right? And then ultimately down to controls. After we do that, we're going to walk through an exercise of generating profile types and profiles, which is a cornerstone of the policy compliance last GRC application we have the compliance overview. So within the policy and compliance application, we have, you can see your policy, uh, excuse me, your compliance requirements, and these are gonna be associated with your different authority documents. You have your overall compliance, and these are based on your controls, right? And I'm gonna show you that a little bit later when you're talking about control testing and indicators and things of that nature. Down here below, we talked about profiles, which we're gonna talk talk about and generate them and show you how they are generated from profile types. Then we also have compliance by authority documents. Now just hold on here for a minute. Um, authority documents, again, are your top level, your ISO, your COVID, your SOX, things of that nature. You can have an authority document within ServiceNow that is specifically set up and created or imported um, that will come in and have all of the citations associated with that document. So what this graph does, it shows compliance level from the authority document. I can drill down to see exactly where our compliance levels are, right? And it will show me again, my controls that are in within the compliance status. Now I clicked on the bar that was compliant, so that's what I have. If I go back, I can also see the other iterations that are not compliant, right? So I can see any that are red that are not compliant and these that are not applicable. Then we also have a compliance breakdown, right? From here, you can break it down by, which is basically like a pivot chart. Uh, you can break it down by the different authority documents. So I have my authority doc, I have my pol uh, policy statements here. And then per policy statements, it shows my compliance levels. 
Now, these are all going to be defined based on indicators, which we're going to talk about later on in this webinar. So it's all done. We can talk about compliant profiles. When we set up the profile in this webinar, you're going to see what a profile is, how you define it, and how overall it can tie up into your organizational structure. So without further ado, we're going to walk through now the authority document. And I'm going to pull over my screen here. We're going to type in policy and compliance and I'll look at authority documents. So again, what is an authority document? So I know I've said this like three or four times, but I want to make sure everyone is clear and understands. And if you are, I'm sorry for repeating over and over again. But authority document is basically your authority documents, uh, such as COBIT, ISO, NIST, PCI, and what you see here on the screen. What they do is these are from the governing bodies of PCI, right? We'll have specific information, if you will, about what you should be using. May not adopt all citations and policy statements associated with the authority document. And there are things that you can do in ServiceNow to either turn on or off these different uh, policy statements that you apply. And I may not cover that entirely in this webinar, but if you have a question and you want to see that, I can easily either do a one on one session with you or provide screenshots if you want that and send an email to Shruti. So we're going to pick on PCI. So within this authority document, we have basic information. Uh, if you see this um, authority document is read only. In ServiceNow, you have the ability that you can import authority documents from the source. What does that mean? If you see here this URL, this is directly from PCI, right? The PCI standards organization. You can import that directly into ServiceNow. So when it brings it in, it automatically brings in the authority document, the description, right? It categorizes it, it gives it the common name. Basically, all these fields up here are brought in. With an exception of number, that is just a ServiceNow number field that gives it the unique value. The source from the Unified System Framework, that's basically from UCF, right? That's uh, within, they have a UCF framework that allows you to go out and download these authority documents. So that's why the source says UCF here. So again, getting to the rest, the citations automatically come down. And so a citation is associated with the authority document on what you should be governing within your organization based on PCI standards for this uh, example. So within a citation, I'm gonna pick on this citation here, right? We would have actually policy statements. Now, in ServiceNow, a policy statement and a control are one-to-one -one once you define your profile type. Again, I'll be showing you that here shortly. So we'll have relationship from a citation statement. So within the policy statement, it's going to give us more information about what exactly we should be doing within this control, right? So, for example, we have classification, category, and type. And then if you see down here below, we have other relationships. So we have either children, I would say we're basically child policy statements, where this policy statement is the parent. And then we also have other citations, right? So what does this mean, right? What this citation means in this specific uh, instance here is that there could be other authority documents that also are, are imported that could be calling upon the same policy statement. So when you, if you import your data uh, from UCF, it's going to make sure it finds any common like citations. So you're not going to have multiple policy statements or duplicates, if you will, um, from existing, or excuse me, uh, duplication create a relationship. So these citations may be related to another authority document. As you can see, this one's to COBIT, right? Then we have other authority documents, as you see down here but we're on PCI. So just because we're on PCI, other authority documents can use same like policy statements. No need for duplication. And what that means when you go do your control testing, they will all float up to the respective related citations and authority documents for overall compliance. So that way, when you're someone like me who is performing control tests, 
I don't have to do it five times, I do it once. All right, so within, I'm gonna go back to policy statements. So that was citations I was talking about and how they can relate to other authority documents for one policy statement. Back to the policy statements from the child parent. So these are all child statements that to this overall parent I have here. So if I pick on this one, uh, install and configure firewalls, right? It's gonna show us also same information. So it's the same record, uh, no, no difference of the record. It just has a parent-child relationship. So you can see how everything floats up. I can have uh, parent policy statement, child policy statements, and overall compliance will float all the way up to the parent level, then ultimately to the authority document. So nothing really is changing on the form other than the fact that it has a parent of the previous record we were on. So overall, the policy statement citation authority document just maintains uh, the data from the overall source, which in this case is PCI. So PCI, again, gives us the citations, the policy statements, the things, the rules that we need to adhere by when we're doing our control testing. So next, what I wanted to do is go over, actually, to controls and show you the relationships from a policy statement to an actual control. So within the controls, we have several things going on. We have one, a relationship to a policy statement, right? There within the control, we have a profile, which I'm gonna show you right after this, show you how this control is generated. Then we have a relationship, we have an owning group, uh, meaning that you may have an uh, overall owning group within the, uh, with, for the control. So for example, I may, I could be the owner, right? But the owning group could be the support team that I manage, right? Uh, whether or not this is a key control. So these are things where a lot of customers have done. Um, and this is a key control. If this is a key control for you, you can then another way for you to report and display and show things that are just key for your organization. Some controls may be needed and necessary, but you want to make sure the key controls are identified so easily for reporting. So that's why they've added this key control. Again, we have our category type and classifications that will port over from the policy statement. Same thing for our description. And down below, we have what we call indicators, right? Indicators, test plans, control tests, and of course, we have attestations and risk if we get into risk management as well. So within the control process, right, this control was generated and is created as a draft. The first thing you want to do is you want to attest the control. So in ServiceNow, they have an attestation process that if you see down, the attestation responded is Mr. Amos. Point, he's going to get an attestation, right? which we have here below, right? And he's going to answer some attestation questions, right? Once he attests and answers the question, it will move to review and then ultimately to monitor. And monitored state is the state once the control is ready to be quote unquote in production, right? So attestation is more of a survey process. Again, you can opt in or out of this if you would like. You can turn these things off if you do not want to use the survey style. As you can see, I've already answered these just for the sake of our uh, webinar, and I've provided some quick answers to the questions we have where we have just some few uh, information on the attestation. So it gives you the results of that survey here. So I'm gonna pick one that I already have that quickly view. So as you can see here, right, we have this one already in a monitored state and it is already marked as read only. So once your controls are set and you've attested them, a quote unquote, and attestation is just truly, uh, we're reviewing the control, making sure the data is accurate, making sure the um, 
everything that's in this actual control is what we would like it to do. Right? So there's that's what the attestation process is. So now once it's in a monitored state, it cannot be modified, right? What we can do is if we want to restart the process, is I can return this to a draft state, right? And then we can start the process of reviewing the control all over again, right? We go through attestation, it goes through review, and also monitor. So the next piece I want to go through is how all of this ties together. So we talked about authority documents. We talked about citations, po uh, profile, excuse me, policy statements. And then we talked about controls. So how are controls actually generated in ServiceNow, right? We saw the relationship is one-to-one -one from a policy statement to a control, but how does it get generated? It's not automatic through the PCI, excuse me, UCF import. So let me show you how it all works. So within the policy and compliance application, there is a profile type. So profile types, to uh, give a brief definition, is how you want to define your areas of how you're going to uh, do your compliance. So what I mean by that is that if you see here, we have business services, companies, data centers, departments, and vendors. And let's go business services. So let's say the business service profile, we want to make sure we define, you know, what they are, number one, right? So we have the profile filters, and I'm just going to pick on the filters first. All right. So when you define your profile type, and let's say you do want business service, I will go into the filters, create a new record, point to the table where I would like to generate profiles from. So the profile type you define, then it generates profiles, which I'll show you in a second. Once I define the filter I want, and I could say, I could even break this down even further if I only wanted certain business services, I can add a condition here. And I could say, all right, well, I only want the business service that has this name is, you know, this SAP, right? So all I care about is the business services that has SAP. Now, I would hope you wouldn't define a business service that says SAP, but just work with me for the demo. So you can define it based on any criteria you want to shorten your list or this, for this case, we want all. So we went with all, right? No filter means we're capturing all records. So going back to the profile type overall definition, what we can do here is that, if you recall, we had the authority document and we had the citations, but within those citations, we had policy statements. So on the profile type, I'm now going to associate policy statements that belong to this profile type. So what I mean, if we have business services, and we're saying we're going to um, ensure that we want to put these set of controls slash policy statements against them. we can associate the policy statements directly to the service. So if I come in here, I'm just going to look for all uh, policy statements, active equals true, and I can pull in any one I want, right? And of course, I can filter down by any ones I may need. So once I hit save, it's going to show me all the policy statements associated with this profile type, profile type. Now, I know we're not discussing necessarily risk, uh, risk management, but just as an overview, I can associate policies, internal policies that you may create. I can associate risk statements if you're doing a risk management framework, okay. overall risk frameworks. And then ultimately, once I save this from the first time, it will generate all these profiles. Since I've already saved this, it already generated the profiles. And what does that mean? That means is for every record within the business service, it's going to create an actual profile record for it. And once I do that, and I'm just going to save it here because I've added some policy statements. Once I do that, within each profile record that is representative 
of the business service table, right? I'm gonna pick on Apple iCloud. You're gonna see it automatically generates controls based on the policy statements that we've actually um, selected on the profile type. So each profile now has a representation of each pol policy statement as a control associated with it. So overall, when you define your profile type and you say these are the policy statements that we need to adhere to for business services in this case, it would automatically, once you save it, it automatically generates controls against that profile. Now within here, it shows within the profile itself, it just gives us the downstream controls. Uh, the engagement issues are gonna come out audit. This is audit management, just to give you that example. So back to the profile type, again, just kind of just to reiterate what I just stated, your generated profile type, we define the profile filter. We stated for this profile, we wanted a business service. Once we said that, we got our filter, what table we want, what filter we want. We then associated the policy statements. Once we associate the policy statements, right, we go ahead and save it and it generates profiles. Once it generates the profiles for every policy statement you have here associated, it generates a one-to-one -one relationship. So wait, let me say it differently. It generates a control and it relates the control one-to-one -to, -one to the policy statement on the actual profile. So tying it all back to that report we had from the beginning on the dashboard, right? We'll see the overall compliance by profile, and I'm gonna go there here in a second. I'll put this in a new window here. So when I define the profile, I could see my overall compliance by profile. I can select my profiles here, and it will change to whatever profile I select if it has any data. Right. I can go back to all, right? And then down below, we also have compliance by profile. I think I passed it here. Yeah, overall compliance and then compliance by profile. And all the different ones, of course, authority documents, compliance breakdown, as we said earlier. And here's my guy I'm looking for, compliance by profiles. Now, this one is not compliant. You can also make a graph or edit this graph to be compliant profiles the opposite direction, meaning you want to see compliant profiles. So that way, when you generate them, you have your overall um, view, if you will, per profile, not just from a high level authority document. So going back to the control, so now that we defined our profile type, actually, I'm going to go through the profile type again and show you the profile. So now that we defined our profile type, I'll pick on business services one more time. So now that we defined our profile type, we got our policy statements, we got our actual profiles, right? And then we have our controls. Actually, I will pick one, another one here in one second that has some compliance on it. Let's go with one that is compliance 100%. So now that we have our actual controls on it, you can see your actual controls against here. And we have a control that's in compliance, right? I'm gonna pick this control here to show you what it looks like. So within this control, right, what you can, when you configure GRC policy compliance, you also have what they call indicators. So your indicators are actually your control testing uh, your automated control testing. What I mean by automated, um, it doesn't do it for you. <laughs> there are some things you can do to have it do it for you, but your indicator is how you set up the test itself. And so I'm gonna pull up this indicator. So from a control, we have what we call an indicator, right? An indicator helps me drive the auto generation of the indicator task. What is the indicator task? The indicator task is what will be assigned to someone, right? 
to say whether or not this is in compliance. So this is your control testing throughout the year. So when something needs to happen, for example, here monthly on the first day of the month, right? And what I'll do is I'll execute one now. There we go. Okay. Got it. All right. So once we have this, and I'm just going to pull up the basic information here. So once we configure our indicator, we have our frequency, right? We have, you know, the method, whether it's basic, pass, fail, right? And then we have what we call supporting data. So this, but then this control testing, what you can do, if, the, if they have tables that exist in ServiceNow that you're testing against, for example, this is a change request, you can have it actually automated, right? It will bring in, you can say, look at this change table. Here are the supporting fields I want, and you give it the criteria. And when I generate the indicator, the actual criteria I'm looking for. If it does not find anything in that criteria, we could tell it to pass or fail this indicator automatically without any intervention if the table exists in ServiceNow. However, this is not the only way. You can do it to where it's manual and somebody actually handles the task and then they actually mark it pass or fail. But this is just a way you could do, a lot of uh, customers do for change requests is definitely one where you can look at your change request and if you need to make sure that, for example, this indicator is, make sure changes are being approved. No changes are approved without risk assessment. So when I ran it, it went through and looked and it had some that did go through without assessment. So what did it do? It failed the actual test. So again, you can have the automation piece. However, you can also have it to where it's manual. Once a test is complete, it gives you what they call an indicator result. The indicator result is what floats all the way up to the actual dashboards. So that's the, where the reports come from, where you're compliant and not compliant. The indicator result does that. So once you have a result on the indicator, it flows up to the control, right? Then it ultimately flows up to the authority document as well the profile, excuse me, the policy statement, and then also the authority document. So that's how the uh, compliance levels are actually shown and stored within ServiceNow through the indicator results. I'm gonna go back to the control here. So just again, to wrap up on control, what we just talked about just here, we talked about the control we talked about the compliance status and how it's being calculated through the indicator and indicator task. We talked about the potential of automating your indicator with, uh, that has data within ServiceNow like change requests. We talked about manual indicators, meaning that you don't have the data that live in ServiceNow. They need to go and look at another system or something like that and then mm -hmm. manually mark the task pass or fail, right? And then ultimately how all that ties back up to the overall um, compliance dashboard. Oh, and I wanted to host, yep, I was just want to say, oh. ask for questions. I want to... Oh yeah, I just wanted to ask, would Sorry. it be possible to take a quick question here or did you want to uh, continue and then take the question? No, I'm ready for questions. Um, this is the perfect time for to pause and ask your questions because we went through a lot. Yeah, since we were so, uh, speaking about the same context, uh, can, uh, can I read it out for you? Okay. Yeah. So the question is, should the downstream controls increase to 13 after you added the two additional policy controls? It is still showing 11. Did you need to do something other than save the record? to generate the downstream um, controls on the profiles? Oh, no, no, no. I didn't save my additions to do it. Other than saving, other than saving here, you don't need to do anything else. Okay, yeah, that's Want to generate, nope, nope. And if it does, that is my system behaving poorly, but 
you don't need to do anything. Once you associate the statement and generate the profile, you will get a one-to-one -one relationship from control to policy statement. So it'll be 13 and 13. Okay, yeah, that's all. Is there any, you can proceed. Now. Any other questions? No, no. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Okay, good question and good catch. So back to the policy and compliance application. So again, we talked about 30 documents, citations, right? So there's one other area that I'll cover in this demo and then I'll hold for more questions is policies. So within uh, policy compliance slash GRC, you can have also your internal policies. So if I go in here and I'm just gonna pick on this policy here, right? So the policies in ServiceNow uh, is essentially a method of way of you displaying your overall internal policies within your organization. Now, if you see here, we have knowledge base and articles and KV articles. So the policy is an extension of the knowledge base. So you can extend your knowledge for GRC from an internal policy perspective to expose this information to your user base within ServiceNow. So on the actual policy, right, I have, of course, you know, the policy type, right? We have the state because there's an overall process flow, right? So all the way through approval. So there's a workflow driving this. So I'll go through draft review. And then once it goes to waiting approval, right, it goes to these two guys who actually, excuse me, review goes to whoever's in this state, uh, excuse me, this value for viewers, and approvers goes when it comes to the waiting approval. So this is the overall method to give you the ability to, so someone cannot just throw out a policy with just publishing it and saying it's ready to go. So they have an overall workflow. Can you, um, turn it off, you absolutely can, um, but there are things that you may want to keep. I will, as you see, service now gives you best practice from their perspective. You at least should have a reviewer. Somebody should at least review the actual policy itself before it goes to publish. But approver is not mandatory, right? And you would see the actual approval down here in the approval step below. So on a actual profile record, I have the description, right? This is my uh, HTML field, even though it's read only, I'm just showing you that. And this is where you would put the, the body of your policy contents. You do have your owning group, your owner, same thing here as we saw in the controls as well, who owns the overall policy, right? But we have our description of what the policy is and then our policy text, right? The knowledge base is going to belong to, in this case, is going to be GRC, right? And if you have any um, knowledge article templates, which is totally something different, not necessarily related to GRC, but if you're using knowledge, you can use templates in order to create your actual policies. I won't go too much deeper in that, but just know you can create templates however you may want to structure from a content and visual uh, for your actual policies. Down below, I can associate any profile types, right, on that profile type definition. I can associate an actual policy. I associate policy statements directly to this um, policy as well. We talked about the approvals. I uh, won't necessarily go in here. And then also, I can actually put in here any controls that we deemed are exempt from this policy. Right. So this way, you can say, hey, yes, this is can tie to the overall process, but this control is exempt from policy. And then we can have parent-child relationship for policies. So overall, you can have an ITIL policy or whatever it is, right? But within the ITIL policy, I have incident management, change management, right? All these different problem management, right? So that ITIL may be my parent, right? So again, the policy can go through workflow, right? can associate the profile type policy statements, right? Can show any exceptions, any, any exempted controls that you wanna have against this policy. And just to show you from a approval process, once it's in that approval state, it's just like any other thing in ServiceNow. I will approve. 
Once approved, it's going to refresh and go to a public state. The C article has been generated and then the GRC knowledge base. So when any user goes into the knowledge base for GRC, they would see this article is published. So right there, I wanted to hold and answer any questions. I wanted to give, last time I did this, um, they stated I didn't give enough time for questions. So I wanted to kind of pause here. Is there any questions? Please, there's a time. Now is the time. Uh, Dante, we have one question here. Um, okay. It says, we, we perform controls and test controls. Are indicators intended to be used for one, the other, or both? Good question. So an indicator on a control is the control test in one variation. I want to make sure this is clear. So I'm going to explain it a little slowly. So yes, when you do your scheduled control testing, that's your indicator. However, there also is a control test. And, and I'm sorry, I'm a very visual person. Let me go to control so I can show you what I'm trying to say. All right, so if you see here, I'm just speaking on related lists. So we have indicators, right? Which is your scheduled control testing. I need to do something every 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, right? Indicator. However, you see there's another one called control test. It's very confusing, right? However, so in control testing, you're gonna start, you will be doing that piece within audit. Audit is a little different from, the, from your every day, uh, monthly, weekly, whatever it is, your scheduled indicators. Audit, you will control test within management. I know we're not covering that, but I'm, I wanna make sure I, I drive this home. So within audit, they don't generate an indicator, it generates a control test and it associates it with the audit. Because although during the audit, you can show proof that you've been doing your indicators and you've been doing what you're supposed to do every 30, 60, 90 days, the audit comes in and says, yes, I know you've been doing that. However, just if those of you who experienced audit, they're still gonna ask you to do it again now. So that's where the control test comes in. It's generated from the audit engagement record. And I hope that answered the question. Any other questions? Oh, that's all we have for now, Dante. I think you can proceed. Thank you. All right. So lastly, or was in, um, well, I can't, was remediation tasks. So again, these are more covered from your audit engagement. And again, we're going to talk more about audit in another webinar. So audit engagement, um, ultimately, we're, since we're talking about, about earlier, let's say that control test fails, generate actual issue, right? So issues in ServiceNow can be generated either from an indicator, you can generate one, you can also generate one from a control test. So when I have an issue, right, that's from a failed test, I can also get a remediation task into an issue. So again, a control test or an indicator fails, and I want to create an issue, and yes, it will happen. From that issue, create a remediation task. We can work the issue by itself. We can create a task. So the remediation task works like any other task in ServiceNow, right? I have an assigned to, the relationship to what issue, right? States, priority, watch list. You're going to see this very similar thing, right? Notes, and then any type of task schedule, right? So what that means is how long it's going to take me. We can plan it out, plan start and end dates. So it gives more of a plan task effect, if you will, around remediation. So lastly, 
what I wanted to really drive home um, before we end this call and, and answer final questions um, is just GRC and policy and compliance in Kingston and previous versions, but mainly in Kingston is what I'm demoing today. Um, configuration is key. Data management is key. You want to make sure that you understand profile types and profiles and then the uh, configuration of them, which is why I've really uh, discussed that this uh, webinar. Also, how policy statements associate with those uh, profile types. And then ultimately how you generate your controls. So hopefully I've answered those. Uh, again, we'll open up for questions. And I think we have one in here. Our mediation task new since Jakarta. Uh, I believe they were, I think they were prior to that, but I want to say yes, the new policy and compliance application came around then. Don't quote me on that. I can get you a better answer and send it to you, Michael. But I want to say yes. Um, we've had a remediation task prior to this, but this process I know is newer since Jakarta. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, um, if there's no other questions, uh, definitely we will end it here and say thanks everyone. I will give you a whole 18 minutes of your time back. I, I was trying to give more time for questions. Last webinar we had a lot of questions. Let me make sure that maybe I see something there. Hang on. Oh wait, Do we have questions here. Sounds your controls. Um, so a couple of that. questions under the chat section. Um, Will the webinar be sent out? Uh, yes, Nicole. I'll uh, I'll be sending out a recording. I'll be just making some edits, and I'll be sending it out by uh, next week. And uh, yeah, that's all. If you have any other questions, attendees, please go ahead and uh, type them in the Q and A section. And our, our chat chat works as well. I'm exactly. <laughs> <laughs> And if there's nothing else, I mean, I really thank you for your time and thank you for uh, listening to me for this last 45 minutes or so. Um, but if you do have questions that you forget to ask on this webinar, please send those questions out to us. We'll be answering any questions you may have via email um, and my normal time is a day. So if you give me one day, I will respond. Um, but other than that, thank you for your time and have a great rest of your day. Yeah. Thank you, Dante, and uh, thanks everyone for attending. We'll all see you next month for our next close webinar. Have a good day.